Okay, the subject that was chosen for tonight's discussion is the question of what we call triage. Triage is the problem of deciding whom you will save when you cannot save everyone, right? You're in a situation of uh, threat to life. You have only one pair of hands. People are bleeding. You can only save one or a limited number of people. What is the Jewish approach to deciding whom you save? But I have been in the situation many times personally as a doctor where I've had to deal with you know multiple I was in the I was in a uh, I was a military officer for a couple of years where I had to deal with people who were injured and very often you have a whole bunch of people injured before you can get assistance you have limited facilities you have to make decisions within seconds what are the Jewish principles that lie behind how you choose and apportion scarce resources and decide who will be saved when you can't save everyone that's a problem known as triage it's an old term coined during the Napoleonic Wars when lots of people were injured. The First World War, you saw similar situation. Very, very large numbers of people injured. And the simplest and most crude triage methodology was to divide the wounded into three groups. Those who were so-called walking wounded would survive anyway. Those who were so desperately injured, they probably were going to die anyway. And you concentrated all your efforts on the third group, the ones that you could save with your help and possibly would die without it. Today, they're much more sophisticated triage protocols, unfortunately and tragically, many of them developed in Israel, right, for obvious reasons. And I'll try to share some of that with you. But in order to take a look at this very amazing area, let me share with you a very interesting and very strange triage dilemma. Uh, and then we'll try to use that as a focus on which to, or framework, if you like, on which to build the concepts, the halachic concepts that lie behind this area. And then we'll circle back and try to answer this particular dilemma. Right, stay with me carefully, because halakhically, fine nuances in a question can make a life and death difference in the output. Okay, so here's the question. A young surgeon in South Africa a number of years ago was training in emergency surgery. And he was working at a place there, the Johannesburg Hospital, which has a very highly developed, uh, what's known as an accident service. It's like in America, you call it the ER, emergency room. But there's a dedicated trauma unit and this is a very, very big unit. It has a very well-developed helicopter service that brings people in from hundreds of miles around. In fact, it's a massive institution. The Johannesburg Hospital, the building is one kilometer long. It's the largest building in Africa. And if you put your eye to the ground in the main corridor on the ground floor, you can see the curvature of the earth. Okay? It's a massive institution. And <coughs> they have this very busy <coughs> accident service. Now, here's the dilemma. This young Jewish doctor was working there. And the hospital had acquired a new machine. It was a new ventilator or ventilator resuscitator. I was no longer present at the time, so I can't tell you exactly what the technology was. But it was some very sophisticated machine, and they had only one. And the hospital had issued a very peculiar instruction. The instruction was that no doctor is allowed to use this machine on any patient whom he considers to be non-salvageable. Okay? In other words, you get a patient who's badly injured, you can see they're not going to survive. You know, South African doctors can always tell exactly how long people are going to live. Uh, you know, we get that down to the second, usually. American doctors usually, you know, very bad at that, but we can, we get it right. And if you can see that this person is not going to live, that's what you call halakhically chaye sha'a. That means a person can only live temporarily as opposed to chaye olam, which means long-term life. In such circumstances, the hospital said, do not use the machine. You got this newfangled machine, you got this patient, you want to put the patient on the machine, do not use the machine. Why do you think they made that rule? Yeah, tonight we're here to learn not only halakhic material, we also learn how to think a little bit halakhically, right? We want to think logically, so let's try and see, let's do the effort of thinking together. They were concerned that if you put the only machine you had on a cell hopeless patient, what would happen half an hour later when you get another person who would come in? That person is salvageable. You no longer have the machine available because it's committed to the first person. And now the second person will die and the first person is going to die anyway. You have only one machine and the hospital said, do not use it. Now, the reason they said was because if you put the machine on the first person who's hopeless, what will happen half an hour later when somebody else comes in? You will not have the machine available and the second person is going to die. The obvious challenge to that is, why don't you simply put the first person on the machine right now? When the second person arrives, detach the first person from the machine, they're going to die anyway, and put it on the second person. Why not? Because it'll take time to detach. No, no, no. You're actively doing it. That's not what they said. The Johannesburg Hospital gave the following reason. They said, if you put the first hopeless person on the machine, half an hour later when somebody else arrives and you walk over to the first person to switch off the machine, their family will object. There'll be scenes of emotion, chaos, hysteria, they won't let you say, we don't want to get into that and therefore don't do it. Now that is completely irrelevant Jewishly. 
The family's emotional response in that circumstance is completely irrelevant. But Jewishly, there's a very good reason for this. And that is that if you put a hopeless person on a ventilator and it's keeping them alive moment to moment, you may not switch off that machine and kill them even to save another life. And the reason is we have a very basic principle in radical halacha called Ein dochin nefesh mipnei nefesh. You cannot push aside one life for another. And in Judaism, you cannot kill somebody, even a temporary life, to save someone, even a long-term life. You cannot kill for that purpose. And therefore, translate the question into Jewish terms. If you put the first person on the machine and the second person arrives with salvageable, despite the fact that the first person is dying, you may not switch off the machine on the person. And therefore, they're both going to die. So maybe it would be better to obey this hospital instruction and not put the first person on the machine, hold the machine in the background, let the first person die sooner, wait till the second person arrives, and save the life with the machine. And that's what the hospital wanted him to do. This young doctor was concerned to know whether this in fact agrees with his Jewish principles. And he went to a world famous rabbi who happened to be in South Africa at the time, and he asked him, what does Judaism require? Does it require me to obey this hospital instruction, which means save a life later, let the first person die? Or does Judaism require me to disobey the hospital instruction, maybe they'll discipline me, lose my job, who knows what will happen. But if that's what I'm required to do, that's what I'll do. I'll use the machine in an illicit fashion against the instructions, and who knows what will happen to me. And not only that, half an hour later, I know someone else is going to die. In addition, and listen carefully to this, he added to his question the following information. He said this hospital is so busy that the scenario is guaranteed. In other words, there's a statistical guarantee here that the second person is going to be here. I'm not talking about whether there's a doubt about that. And I'm not going to argue this evening about whether we accept statistical certainty as a halachic reality. I'm going to assume that's the case. It's a very interesting question in halacha. But let's assume that you have a statistical guarantee. That means he even said this place is so busy that I will guarantee you that a Jewish patient is going to arrive who will need the machine. Let's leave it out. It's complicated enough without that. But that's what he said. So our question is this. I have patient one who's hopeless. I have this machine, which will give him the best chance of a survival in the short term. But if I hold it in abeyance, I will be able to save a life later, which is guaranteed to be here. So in those circumstances where I have the first person who's not salvageable, guaranteed to be here a second person, what do I do in that circumstance? If you think about it, you'll realize this is a weird triage dilemma. Normally triage means I stop at an accident, two people, I don't know, do people stop at accidents anymore? Yes. Do they? Do they? Yeah. Well, in, uh, in America, they don't because they don't want to get sued. In South Africa, they don't because they don't want to get AIDS. In Britain, where I live now, they don't because they're too polite. <coughs> but, you know, anyway. In Australia, they do. I'm, no sure, I'm sure Australia is perfect. So, um, <laughs> so what is, you stop at an accident. You have two people who are bleeding. You can only save one. That's the classic triage dilemma. In our strange case, we have two people, but one of whom is here and one of whom is not here yet. In fact, the second person isn't even a patient yet. Right now at 8 in the morning, he's mumbling at his wife from behind the newspaper, not knowing that in half an hour he's going to run into a truck on the highway and be badly injured, but he is. So this, did you see that? That's a strange triage dilemma. We do have two people, one who's here now and one who's guaranteed to be here by statistical guarantee, but he's not here yet. Okay? Strange, but that's our dilemma. Let's think about it. So first of all, let me point out to you that triage is not only an immediate acute emergency situation. Triage is a very broad issue. For example, let's say you are a hospital director and your job is to apportion the budget. Right? This is for you. Are you allowed to spend money on a well baby clinic where they measure the kids and give them vitamins and all that if you don't have enough intensive care surgical beds? That's a triage problem. What about a country? Is a country allowed to spend money on its parks and museums and tourist attractions if it doesn't have enough money for military and emergency? That's a triage problem political level. So this cuts across society throughout. The Talmud says, if you have a river flowing past two cities where there's enough water in the river that if the upstream people drink, there'll be enough water for the downstream people to drink as well. But if the upstream people drink and wash, there'll be no water left and these people will die of thirst. What's your duty as a Jew living in the upstream city? Do you drink and wash and let them die of thirst? Or you constrained to drink only and leave enough water them for drink for them to drink. What would you think? The conclusion in the Talmud is that these people drink and wash and they let them die. Reason is, says the Talmud, if they don't wash, there'll be an outbreak of hygiene-related epidemic in their community. Whether the word means typhus or we we're not so sure what the Aramaic word means for that type of epidemic. But although it won't kill them as rapidly as thirst will kill them the next day, they're allowed to factor that in. That's called Pikuach Nefesh. So they're very broad issues here, right? I'll give you another example. A few years ago, a couple living in a certain European city found themselves unable to have children for many years. They ended up at a very slick fertility unit at a Tel Aviv hospital, and they had a child. 
This couple happens to be exceptionally wealthy and the father in his joy made a massive donation to the hospital on condition that it's only allowed to be used to help other people have children. But this was an Israeli situation. I don't have to tell you, Israelis often have their own quite definite opinions about things. And the hospital director said, I'm not taking your money for that. It's immoral of you. It's immoral of you to pay for people to have children when I've got dying people who need to be treated. I've got people in my hospital who are dying and you want to spend your money on helping new people come into the world. That's immoral. I'm not taking your money. So the man said, fine, I'm not giving it. And they had a big argument about it. Instead of just taking the money, you know, it reminds me, in the last generation was a rabbi called the Ponovich Arov. He was a very, very amazing <coughs> individual and very shrewd. And this rabbi had a friend who was Jew Jewishly, he was uh, extremely wealthy and extremely generous, but he was a little Jewishly challenged. This man promised the rabbi enough money to build an entire yeshiva on condition that the students would not have to wear these. The rabbi promised, he took the money and he built a girls' school. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to handle these situations, okay? But in this case, the man refused to give his money. So they went to see Rabbi Yashiv, great rabbinic authority in Jerusalem, and they asked him what to do. And Rabbi Yashiv said, the man's fully entitled to give his money to the fertility unit. So the hospital director said, Rabbi, how can you say that? Pikur nefesh, we're talking about saving lives. And the rabbi said as follows, he said that when a country funds only emergencies, people get an embattled mentality, that affects their morale, and that's a life and death matter as well. Now you need very broad halachic shoulders to be able to say that, right? But that's what he said. So societal and broad level issues, high level, broader issues are also relevant in trios, not only the emergency situation. You get all sorts of weird, one weird situation I can think of is that some years ago in Netanya, you know, Laniado Hospital in Netanya is a hospital run on religious lines. A wealthy American donated a kidney dialysis machine to the hospital on condition that the machine's only allowed to be used for tourists. Why? Because he was concerned that an American in kidney failure could never visit Israel. No one's going to dialyze you in a country that doesn't have enough facilities for its own people. So put the machine into Netanya. American in kidney failure will visit Israel. He'll tour around the country. Every two or three nights, he'll sleep over in Netanya, be dialyzed. And between sessions, he'll fly home. You can guess what happened. They put the machine in. Immediately, someone arrived in kidney failure who was not a tourist. They went to the Rebbe in charge of the hospital, Klausenberg Rebbe. He said, Pikach Nefesh used the machine. Now it's used fully, all the time. Do not ask me what would happen if a tourist and a non-tourist arrived at the same time. I have no idea. But that is a... So you get all sorts of weird triage situations. Not only that, but in civilian medicine, first of all, you know that in disaster situations, as I said, the protocols, give me a second, just many of them are developed in Israel. You know that, for example, one of the main triage principles that's used in the military and in mass disasters is that before you treat anyone, you need to triage everyone. So you come upon a disaster scene, you've got 20 people injured, you have to rapidly assess everybody before you treat anyone. And there's a special color coding you use, a black tag means a person's dead, red means something else, yellow means something else, it's a whole organized system. Does not always accord with Jewish law. Now for example, let's say you're treating people as a young lady doctor in Tel Aviv, she arrived at a, at a, a, a terrorist attack, she rapidly tried to assess everybody, and she came across a seven-year-old child bleeding badly from the neck. She put a finger on the bleed and stopped the bleeding, and now what's she supposed to do? takes a finger off to check everybody else, the kid will die. According to most triage protocols, that's what you have to do. Because there may be 10 other people dying. But in Judaism, you can't do that. You can't, you can't cause this person to die now, even if you may find others. And the reason is, this is called a vadai, and the others are called a suffolk. This is a certainty, the others are doubtful. And therefore, you'd have to stop here right now. There would be exceptions in the military situation. But I'll give you an example. I heard from a <coughs> certain Israeli doctor, I was at a meeting of Israeli doctors, one of us told us about a friend of his who is a senior Israeli army surgeon who was sent into Lebanon with a group of Israeli soldiers and he had with him one paramedic. So a very senior doctor, a paramedic and a whole bunch of soldiers. After they crossed the border, one of the soldiers was very badly injured. And this doctor said, completely secular doctor, a Chiloni, totally secular Israeli doctor, he said this soldier was so badly injured that he was confident that if he had a helicopter, radioed for a helicopter and had him flown back to Haifa, the soldier would almost certainly survive, but only if he went with him in the helicopter. But to do that, he had to leave the other soldiers without a doctor. But if he stayed with his men and he sent him back with a paramedic, he'd almost certainly die. And he said he had no idea what to do. He said, terribly frustrated on the battlefield, and he said for the first time in his secular life, he began praying very hard, and actually what happened was a big helicopter came and took them all. Now that's not the point of the story. When he got home, he asked his religious friend what he should have done, and he went to ask Rav Yashiv, great rabbi in Jerusalem, and Rav Yashiv said that if that would have been a civilian scenario, there's no question that he would have to take the man back. Because here's a vadai, 
dying person, and a suffolk, maybe others will be injured later. But in the army, you stay put. In the military situation, your job is to be with those men and to support the mission. And if the danger's been already factored into the situation, that's what you do, and you send him home, although he may, uh, may die. So you get many, many varieties. Not only that, but in civilian medicine, if you walk into an NHS hospital in England, where, where I live right now, and you say you've got chest pain, the first thing you'll hear is triage. And somebody skilled at rapid assessment of how urgent your case is will run over immediately, and they'll check you out. If they decide that you're an absolute, total, absolute amazing emergency, you only have to wait until Wednesday. You know? <laughs> and uh, if they decide it's a normal emergency, you wait until October. You know? But the point is that they stratify people in a hierarchy of risk so that they can apportion treatment. And all sorts of crazy questions. I mean, some months ago here in Israel, somebody asked one of the rabbis, when we come to a terrorist attack, are we allowed to walk on dying people to get to someone we might save? We might extinguish lives in doing so. And every time you bring in heavy machinery to excavate a building that has been exploded, to dig out people who might be surviving, you might crush others on the way. Right? These are real-time questions in triage, and of course, there are many other varieties as well. But let's try and focus briefly this evening on the immediate acute problem. You've got two people in front of you. What are the Jewish principles we use in deciding whom we save? Let's study those principles, and they will circle back and deal with our ventilator question. So imagine I walk into a room, yeah, picture's worth a thousand words. There's two dying people, okay? I got one pair of hands, and I can only save one. What would you look at first as a differential between the two people? What would you look at in order to decide whom you would save? Age. Age. Age is not a hardcore criterion in Judaism. Some rabbinic authorities say that you'd save the younger. Some say you save the older. This is an interesting, interesting question, but age is not the first thing. Gender. 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 Yeah. The usual... Uh, yeah, which gender would you say first? Women. women. Why? Because they're, because they're more vulnerable. Because women can have children. Because they can reproduce. Uh, men are required, you know. I mean, uh, you know. Yeah, but not. It's not the women. Okay. Um, you obviously haven't studied biology, no? But, uh, but um, no, we don't say women first. In fact, there's no gender differentiation. The only difference is the Talmud says, for example, if terrorists capture people, and you can only ransom back a limited number, we save the women before the men. Before the men. But the reason is because they're almost certain to be sexually interfered with, which will not happen to the men, and because of the differential suffering, you would save the women. The Code of Jewish Law says that if the terrorists are homosexuals, you have to save the men first. Because that's a greater indignity. Right? So therefore, it's not a question of whose life is worth more, it's a question of differential suffering. But in terms of value of life, we will not save men or women first. Any other differentials? You know, the Americans always say, who's got insurance? You know, who's got insurance? That's not right. What else would you use to differentiate? The current medical condition. Let's say the current medical condition is exactly the same. What else would you look at? Yeah. Where they are in relation to them. Yes, yes. Probably the most basic of all criteria is, criteria, you save the one who's closest to you. If I walk into the room from here, I have to save this person first. What's the reason? If you walk past the first person, then they'll no. be sure that they're going to... Why? Die. Why do you say the one who's closer first? Because then it's like you're walking past them. Why cannot you walk? Why can you not walk past the closer person? You're killing, basically killing no, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. How am I killing? No. But here's the first no, one. First couple no. said. The reason is like this. <laughs> yeah, that may be how they do it in Australia, yeah? You can move that person out of the way and then get other people. No, no, no. You, you say, I'll tell you the reason. The reason is this. There's a principle in halacha called Ein ma'avirin ala mitzvot. You're not allowed to bypass a mitzvah. In other words, as you approach these two people, right now you have a, you, incumbent on you is a life-saving mitzvah of pikuach nefesh, saving life. You cannot walk past that to an equivalent, more distant mitzvah. Very important principle in halacha. That's called Ein ma'avirin ala mitzvot. You cannot bypass a mitzvah. So when you've got two equivalent mitzvahs and one is closer, you can't walk past it. Okay, now, now, just, just one second. What if I walk in from here? They're equidistant. One's my brother, one's a stranger. Who do you say first? Your brother, right? Why? Because your mother will be upset? Why do you save your brother first? So why do you save the person you have a personal relationship with first? Uh, you know, there are lots of brothers that the brothers don't care about. You know, there are lots of relatives that... Yeah. The other fellow is somebody else's brother distracted if you don't save your brother. And what if this is a brother you don't specially like? Why? Why do you have obligation to your family first? Because the Torah says, Mipsalcha al titalem, do not ignore your flesh. So there's a verse in the Torah that says that you have an obligation to a relative. Just, just stay with me. 
This law, by the way, is the reason you have to give charity to relations before strangers. Your parents come first, after that grandparents. Interesting hierarchy of priority. But you have to give charity to people that are related to you. You also have to give to a friend or a neighbor before a stranger. You also have to give people in your city before people in more distant cities. You have devolving layers of concentric layers of responsibility. And Jews living in a particular city have to give Jewish causes, in, Jewish and non-Jewish causes, in their city before more distant, except for Jerusalem. Wherever you live, you can prioritize Yerushalayim equivalent to your city, because notionally we all live in Yerushalayim. And many halachic authorities say anywhere in Israel as well. And that's notionally your, where, you, where you live, but certainly your own community comes first. And therefore, you have an obligation to treat family before strangers. Now, stay with me. Here's a chance to use your black belt halachic thinking. What's the next dilemma I'm going to put to you? Come on, what's the next question? Now, I, 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 before you put your foot in it, Use logic. Come on, what's the next essential question here? Make my day. Two family members. Two family members? No, not logical. Two strangers? Not logical. Yeah, shh, shh, shh. A family member and your husband or wife. A family member or husband or wife. Who would you say first? Husband. Yeah, halachically, husband and wife are considered the same person. Husband are not considered relatives. They're considered the same person. A Jewish husband has to pay for his wife's all her medical needs, all her fines, her burial expenses. He has to ransom her from captivity if she's captured by terrorists. Assuming he didn't hire the terrorists in the first place to <laughs> capture her. You're not being logical, okay? Come on, I want logic here. Yeah. Why are the two people who are equidistant from you? No, that's not logical. You're not being logical. If your mom would you pick your husband or wife over your children? That's an interesting question. Probably yes. What? Could be. But that's not the question. Come on, what's the next question? Call, call emergency services. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm the emergency service right now. <laughs> yeah. That's not logical. If you're, if you're, what if your family member, you had to buy a Excellent, of course. The next que the question is this. What happens if I walk in from here, the first person is, is closer, and the further is my brother? Yeah, we have two principles. Proximity is the first criterion. The second criterion, relationship. Which priority takes priority? Isn't that the logical next question? You look after your Isn't that the logical next question, even if you're Australian? Yeah. And therefore, we are learning to think halachically, logically, okay? Criteria number one, proximity. Do not bypass a mitzvah. Criteria number two, who's related to me? Which priority takes priority? Brother. Yes. Brother. In fact, it's one of the rare halachic situations where you walk past the closer person and you treat your brother. Okay, that's what you do. For homework, why? This is a black belt halachic question. Both of these have Torah derivations. Do not bypass a mitzvah is derived from the Torah. Do not ignore your flesh is derived from the Torah. So how come you prioritize your relationship over proximity? This takes a little time to think about. Think about it. Okay, this is worth a lot of thought and for every correct answer Jackie's going to buy you a whiskey. Cocaine, whatever you're into in these days. Um, that's an interesting question. Why do we bypass the closer mitzvah to prioritize the criterion of relationship? Okay, now Next one. I walk in from here. They're both equidistant. They're both equally related to me. One is terminal and one is salvageable. This one is called Chaye Sha'a. This one is called Chaye Olam. Namely, is, it, is that clear? This person has got cancer. They're going to live for three months or six months. Halakhically, life that less than a year is called terminally ill, without going to derivation for that. Chaye Sha'a means the person will live for less than a year. So this person's got a terrible disease. They're going to die in six months' time. This person's perfectly healthy. Right now they've been disastrously injured, they're both bleeding to death. If I save this person, he will live in the long term. If I save this person, he will die in three months' time from his disease. Which one do I save? This is a no-brainer, right? You save the long-term life. What happens if I walk in from here? The first person is a chayei sha'a. This person can live for six months. There's no question you have to save a person for six months, right? Halakhically you break Shabbat to save a person for one extra second of life, even if he's unconscious. So no question that I have to save this person. But if I walk past him, I will save a person who will live in the long term. What do you do? No. You walk pa listen carefully, you walk past the closer person and you save the person who is more distant, provided the first person is not conscious. If the first person is conscious, you do not walk past him. Why? Because if he is aware, he will... <laughs> Why can you not walk past somebody who's aware? Because he'll be, feel abandoned and hopeless and therefore die sooner. Because a person's emotional status 
is very relevant to their survival. Any experienced doctor knows that. And therefore, feelings of abandonment, hopelessness, pain, anguish, despair, depression, those are additive, tangible, lethal factors in Judaism. And so if he's aware, you cannot walk past him. But if he's unconscious or unaware, you walk past the non-salvageable person and you save the salvageable person. Everything we're discussing tonight, here comes the key. Notice what's happening. I'm walking past a person whom I have an obligation to save, correct? This person I have an obligation to save him, even though he's only going to live for six months. But I'm bypassing him. Why? Because I have a prior life-saving mitzvah. And here comes the rule. Whenever you break a Torah mitzvah, you, ever, you, you, you desecrate the Shabbos, you eat unkosher food, you eat on Yom Kippur, you break any Torah law to save a life, there's one criterion that needs to be satisfied. And that is that the life you're trying to save must be here now. That's called a Cholei Lefanenu. In other words, to break a Torah law for knowledge that may save lives in the future, you're not allowed to do that. It's below the red line. Right, for example, can you break Shabbat to save life? Yeah. Yeah. Can you eat unkosher food to save life? Yeah. Can you eat on Yom Kippur to save life? Yeah. But show me the life. There's got to be a person here now. For example, give an example. In Judaism, you cannot dissect a dead body. Right? No autopsy is allowed. Three potential Torah prohibitions in desecrating a body. Many rabbinic authorities say it applies to Jews and non-Jews because the human body is formed in the divine image, not specifically a Jewish thing. You cannot dissect the human body, three potential Torah prohibitions. Can you dissect the human body to save life? Yes. yes. Because the only things you cannot do to save life are sexual immorality, idolatry and murder. Without going into the background of the details, those three things you cannot do to save life. Just one second. But desecrating a human body is not one of those things, right? Desecrating a body is not murder, the guy's dead. It's not idolatry unless you're very strange. It's not sexual immorality unless you're very kinky, right? <laughs> and therefore, and therefore, right, you are dissecting. You work in a hospital, you have a patient in your ward who's got a weird disease. He's got yellow squares all over his body and he's flashing like a neon light, right? You don't even see that in Chile, do you? Weird disease. Suddenly the patient dies. Everyone wants to get their hands on his liver and spleen to see what's doing. Nothing doing in Jewish law. You prepare the patient for burial. Suddenly the patient in the next bed gets yellow squares and starts flashing. Jewish law says you go find the first person and you cut him up now. Why? Because there's a chole lefanenu. There's somebody in front of us now who may be in danger. And by the way, the degree of danger is irrelevant and the probability of saving him is irrelevant. Because when it comes to saving life, we don't look at majorities or statistics. Do you know in all of Jewish law we use majorities? You're aware of that? But not in saving life. If you're cooking a meat soup and a few drops of milk fall in accident, don't, don't try this at home. Okay? But if you're cooking a meat soup and a few drops of milk fall in accidentally, it's kosher. If you throw it out because you think you're being religious, you're guilty of wasting. Because the majority annuls the minority, but not in life saving. So if there's any chance this person might be at risk, and if there's any chance you could save him, you cut up a person in order to save a life. And therefore we're breaking, just one second, we're breaking Torah law in order to save life, provided that the life is here now. That's called a chole lefane. Is this clear, that principle? Yeah. Okay, now listen carefully. What is the meaning of lefaneinu? One of the great halachic authorities who writes about this, Nodib Yehuda, he makes it plain that lefaneinu does not mean the same room or the same hospital or the same city. It means a real, identified, extant individual. For example, in virtually every Western country today, organ transplantation is done by a computerized national matching list. So when kidneys are taken from a hospital for a transplantation in the, in the morning, the doctors taking the kidneys don't even know who's going to get them. But six hours later, somebody in another city may get the kidneys. And the reason is because there's a national computerized list, and the next best match on the list is the person who's going to get the organs. Even though they may not be in the same city, I don't even know his name. But that is called lefanenu. Is that clear? In military situations, again, it's different. In Israel, for example, all halachic authorities allow the harvesting and freezing of skin and bone, right? In other words, people can donate skin, bone, corneas of eyes to be banked and frozen because soldiers may need them if they get burned or injured. And although there's no one burnt or injured now, <coughs> because there's a real and present danger in a country facing a military threat, that's good enough, right? And to take bone and skin, of course, you can wait until the person is dead, not like taking a heart. There's no problem with that. <coughs> so you need a real and present danger, or you need a person present. That is the red line halachically. And that's called the fanenu. I'll give you an extreme example. I think we mentioned this the other night, but I'll repeat it again. 1986, a baby was born with heart disease in California. The surgeon was a famous chest surgeon, Norman Shumway decided for the first time in history to transplant a heart into a baby. There was no other hope for the child, right? You know heart transplantation only began in 1968, as we mentioned before, in a certain well-known country. Um, and um, 
By 1986, no one had ever tried to transplant a child, but there was no other hope. The only heart they could find for the child was in Vermont. And although it was 3,000 miles away, there was no other hope. They flew one of the young surgeons in, this, um, in a private jet that they hired across the country. He cut out the heart of the child in Vermont. And unfortunately, they could not get the plane started. They couldn't get the plane started. They ended up scrambling a United States Air Force supersonic fighter, put a terrified young surgeon in the back of a supersonic fighter with a heart in a box on his lap. When they got back to California, they had to resuscitate the surgeon. But they did, and they saved the life of the baby in California, right? That 6,000 miles, halakhically, is called Lefanenu. Do you see that? Are we together? Yeah. Because the distance is not the issue. The issue is that there was a real identified person. That's the concept of Lefanenu. Let's come back to that question. The question was, young surgeon, employed by hospital, got a newfangled machine. The hospital has told him, do not use this machine on anyone who's not salvageable. Okay? And he doesn't know whether that's correct or not. So he went to ask a rabbi the, uh, the question. And there were three answers to this. The, the question went to three rabbinic authorities. And there were three completely different answers to this very simple yes or no question. <coughs> he was given a particular instruction by the rabbi he asked. And so that satisfied him. Halakhically, if you ask a rabbi for a psak, that means a ruling, you're bound by the <coughs> ruling. You can ask 10 rabbis their opinions and make up your own mind. But if you ask a rabbi for a ruling, then you're fixed by that. You can't shop around. You have a joke about this in Israel. There's a CD-ROM made by Barilan University. On that CD is every single halakhic question that has ever been asked. The joke is like this. You ask it what you want to hear, and it <coughs> tells you whom to ask. That's wrong. That's wrong, okay? If you ask for a ruling from a rabbi, then you're bound by that. So he was told what to do by the rabbi, but the rabbi sent the question to two other great halakhic authorities, one in Jerusalem and one in Bnei Brak, and there were three completely different answers to the question. And I'll tell you what those answers were. But before we, uh, before we do that, let's, let's get the scenario clear again. I got my newfangled machine, I got my hopeless patient, and the question is, do I commit it to the patient and watch someone die an hour from now? Or do I hold it in abeyance, let the first person die, and save the life that's coming? And that's our problem, right? Correct? That is the question. So the first answer that he was given was, and let's think about the situation, right? I walk in from here. The first person is hopeless, I bypass them if they're unconscious, and I save the second person. So let's assume that I come on duty at 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm a trauma surgeon, I sit there studying my page of Gemara like all good trauma surgeons do, and they call me over and they say, someone badly injured, I rush over, check out the patient, I can see he's completely hopeless. Okay, this person is a chaye sha'a, there's no way that he could survive. But I have my new machine, and I would like to connect it to the patient, but just before I do, I see the door open, and I see that they're wheeling in a chaye olam somebody who could live in the long term. Do I quickly commit the machine to the first hopeless person or do I wait till the first second person arrives? Absolutely unconscious. No hope of consciousness, doesn't know what's going on. Do I wait? Okay, even though he's more distant, because from here to the door, is that called lefanenu? Yes. Excellent. Number two, eight in the morning, come on duty, badly injured person, newfangled machine. As I'm about to put the machine on, the phone rings. On the phone they tell me that there's an ambulance on its way, 10 miles away in the ambulance is a salvageable patient. Wait 10 minutes, he'll be here. Do I wait? Yes. 10 miles left on Anu? Wait, is the guy Great. Uh, hopeless. Number three, 8 in the morning, badly injured person, about to put the machine on. The radio crackles to life. On the radio, they tell me that the helicopter's on its way. It's 150 miles away. In the helicopter is a salvageable person. If I wait for an hour, I'll save his life. Do I wait? Yes. Yes. 150 miles left on Anu? Yes. Okay, now listen very carefully. And if this doesn't move you, there's no hope for you. Come on duty, badly injured person, about to put the machine on, no door opening, no phone call, no radio call, but there's a statistical guarantee that someone's going to be here now for now. Is a statistical lefanenu called lefanenu? Yes. Well, one second, you have to enjoy the question. <laughs> Isn't that an amazing question? Isn't that an amazing question? Even if you're Australian? Yes. <laughs> What's the concept of lefanenu? Does it mean a real person here, or does it mean the life you wish to save? Normally, both of those are conflated in one situation. I've got a person here whom I want to save. In our Australian situation, we don't have a person here, but we have a life to save. Because if we use the machine on the first person, we're guaranteed that half an hour from now somebody's going to die, even though it doesn't exist yet. What's the concern of Lefanen? Did you see the problem? So what would you say? No, no. no. Yes. You said that you can't um, like bypass the Mitzvah City, the first one, if it's to save a future life that you don't really know yet. Well, the question is, he's guaranteed to be here. Let me tell you what happened. The first rabbi asked the question, said to this young doctor, the hospital's correct. In my opinion, don't use the machine. Let the first person die. Do whatever you can for him. Save the life. 
That's coming second, that's called Lefanun. And of course he was told that, don't have to lose your job, that's what he did. Second opinion was, I don't call that Lefanenu, you treat the first person now, what will happen now from now you have to do. And the third opinion was very interesting. And listen carefully, it sounds weird, but listen well. The third opinion was a famous rabbi in Bnei Brak, Rav Zilberstein, Rav Lefshi's son-in-law. He said they're both wrong. And here's what you do. You take your newfangled machine and you attach to it a clock and a bell. And as soon as the first person arrives, right away you set the machine running and you switch on the timer. The machine runs for half an hour, rings a bell to warn you that it's going to switch off, and it switches off, you rush over and switch it on again. Machine works for another half hour, warns you, switches off, you switch it on again. You keep doing that till the second person arrives. When the second person arrives, you wait till the machine switches off, and instead of switching it on on the first person, you switch it on on the second. Now whether the Johannesburg Hospital would like Shabbat clocks on its ventilators, I don't know. But amazing as that suggestion was, it's about to happen. Hadassah Hospital and Shariat Sedek have just built a machine like that. And the reason is very interesting. Listen carefully. Because at first glance, this sounds like a cowardly way to switch off machines on people because you're not prepared to switch them off yourself. And that's not the logic. So listen very carefully. This has very extreme right-wing halachic approval. And the Knesset has approved it. In fact, they are waiting now for a Knesset subcommittee um, insurance uh, approval. And they're about to run a human trial. They've now got the machine working successfully on, on models. And they're about to go human. But the logic is important to understand, and it's this. Here's, here's, the, here's the drama and here's the tragedy. In every hospital in the world today, people working in intensive care have the following dilemma. And I've been in the situation myself and it's absolutely nightmarish. You get a person in your hospital in respiratory failure. They've got swine flu or some disease of their lungs. And they need ventilation urgently. The problem is, will they recover on the machine or will they not recover? Your worst fear is putting a person like that onto a machine that will not recover. Because you'll have them on the machine for three months and then they'll die anyway. And during that time, lots of other people will not be saved because the machine's not available. And you don't have enough machines. So what do we do? We try our best to assess the patients and only accept the ones that look like they'll recover. And you cannot do that accurately. So lots of people are sent home to die. Because we don't think they're going to recover. And without question, many people who could have recovered are dying. How do people sleep at night making those decisions? So here's the solution. Don't do that. Have all ICU ventilators on timed cutoffs. I was at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York recently. I gave a talk to the ethics committee there. They told me they're about to put all their ICU ventilators onto timed cutoffs. Why? Because when a person comes in respiratory failure, instead of making a judgment about whether you think they'll survive or not, put them on the machine right away. But you say to them, my dear sir, you have two options. You either go home and die in respiratory failure, or we'll give you five days trial of therapy on this machine. If your lungs appear to be recovering during that time, we'll keep you going. If it becomes apparent that your case is hopeless, when the machine switches off, we will not switch it on again. Or, more accurately, we'll switch it on on somebody else. So this is not a cowardly way of switching off machines. It's a way of giving people a trial of therapy that they wouldn't have had otherwise. You, you see the logic? And what's happened now is that they have selected a group of patients in Israel. They're about to grow human. I'll stop for questions in a moment. They're about to grow human. They've chosen an interesting group of patients. They've chosen people who have respiratory failure due to neurodegenerative disease. People who are have neurological problems that are leading to respiratory failure, will not be able to breathe, and they'll die because they cannot breathe. They've taken a group of these people who have signed a request that when they stop breathing, they do not want to be put on machines. So they've gone to a number of these people and said, do us a favor. When your time comes and you cannot breathe, allow us to put you on a machine for one week extra. And when the machine switches off, we promise you we'll let you die. Give us an extra week of your life to prove the technology. And they've all said, of course, if we can help other people, absolutely. The reason they've chosen these people is so that nobody can accuse them of having killed people by means of this machine. All you'll be able to accuse the researchers of is having given people an extra week of life. Do you understand? And that is the situation. And coming to a hospital near you soon, without doubt, is going to be this technology. By the way, I'll finish with this. Developing the electronic circuitry to switch off the machines at a timed cutoff was very challenging. Okay? It took the Israelis a, lot of, a long time to develop the electronics to make a timer that would work successfully. Why? Isn't that a trivial problem? Go to your local hardware store, get a timer that you stick in the socket, put your machine in and it'll work to uh, switch off. What's the problem? That if you switch off the current to an ICU ventilator, it refuses to switch off. It goes crazy. It starts alarming and bleeping and squawking. It's like backup batteries. They do not switch off. They're designed not to fail. So you've got to design a circuit that will cut the power and switch off the machine, but not override the alarms and the backups when it shouldn't. That's a life and death problem. 
Now they're confident they've got the electronics reliable enough that will switch off the machines when they want them to, but will not defeat the backups and alarms, and they're about to run a human trial. And I have no doubt that this is going to become the standard technology, and the reason is to solve the problem of inadequate machines, we will use pre-time cutoffs and we'll use them for trials of therapy.